All right. I think we're about to get started. I think by now you should see that we're going to do some creative activities. So uh, we have some Play-Doh. Uh, we also, we're also going to do a quick drawing activity. And so I think we have some paper and some pens. But um, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. It's been a decade since I've been to Bangalore. Like this year, I used to work with Microsoft. And I did the Microsoft Research Labs in Bangalore. And it's just incredible to see how much things have changed. I've been very blessed to be able to come back and see all this. And I, literally, I was blessed yesterday at the Shiva Temple. We went on a tour. And uh, I'm not sure if they're supposed to have physical contact, but at one point, it's a blessing. She kind of knocked my nose. And uh, so it's been a really kind of wake up and amazing experience for me. So I need to design at Walmart, and which is kind of interesting because, you know, as a designer growing up, I never really thought about having a life goal. Someday, please let me work at Walmart. You know, Walmart and design are kind of an oxymoron in some ways. It's like, does Walmart even care about design? Um, and I've always found myself working at Microsoft, and I would thank a little bit that I take a lot of pleasure in being in cultures where design can have a big change. So I have a couple hundred designers at Walmart. We actually have a team here in Bangalore at Walmart Labs, and we are working on all the new ways that we can shop. And uh, everything changed about two years ago. Uh, Walmart bought this company called Jet.com. If you guys have Jet.com. So Jet was this really interesting scrappy startup in New Jersey that Walmart felt was really, um, they did some really interesting things around price. Like for example, if you promise not to return a product when you were ordering online, they'd give you some money off. If you used your debit card for the purchase and you didn't have to pay the credit card 1% transaction fees, they would give you 1% back. And so Walmart, who cares a lot about low prices, saw Jet and said, this is interesting. So we bought Jet for $3 billion, which is pretty amazing because Jet actually wasn't making any money at this time. Um, and they brought on Jet's CEO, Mark Lurie, as the head and the CEO of Walmart. And then he brought on a new generation of leaders across technology and product design. Um, and I joined. And so I wanted to talk a little bit today about some future ideas, much in line with what we heard from Alan earlier about this idea of working backwards and thinking about our impact on society. You probably wouldn't know that Walmart cares about this area, but I, I wanted to let you know some of the things, the humble steps our design team is taking to think about how to design for a little bit better. Our first step was doing something called two day free shipping, which, for those of you that have shopped, at Amazon and elsewhere, this is just kind of obvious, right? Like, I want to get my stuff fast and affordable. We launched this about a year ago, and this was, um, how many of you guys have shopped at Walmart.com? Okay. So when you're at Walmart.com, you don't have to get something like a Prime membership to get fast today free shipping. You just have to get $35 worth of goods that comes automatically. So this, this doubled the number of people who were starting to shop at Walmart. We then um, did this thing where if you're ordering something online and it's your local one, in the U.S., 94% of the U.S. population is less than 15 miles from a Walmart somewhere. Um, so if you're ordering something online, and if that is in stock at your local Walmart, we'll actually give you money to go to the store to pick it up. Because it's really expensive to get that last mile of delivery to your house. This doubled the number of people that started connecting with our physical stores who didn't shop in our stores before. And then the third thing we did is my favorite. Does anyone know what these things are? These are Amazon Dash buttons. And so if you're an Amazon Prime member, and in this case with you know, Kraft macaroni and cheese, you want some more Kraft macaroni and cheese, you just press the button basically sends a little you know, message over Wi-Fi um, and reorders that item. Now, our family is in Silicon Valley. We haven't been to a ranch yet. Disconnected from the hubbub of Silicon Valley. 
we have about 12 of these buttons throughout our house. And, you know, our kids and, you know, we were custom spots all the time. But we actually ended up as a family doing a hackathon with this cancel news. And instead of ordering stuff from Amazon, when you press any one of our buttons, it now opens up this page. At Walmart, this is actually what we call the easy order page. We do a lot of work on the patterns of shopping. So this is actually my personal easy reorder page. And it was amazing because when I took this screenshot on this day, I've got three kids, all with super curly hair. My daughter is constantly clogging the sink. Um, and so, like, you know, there was a perfect prediction of what I needed that week, you know, because I get, like, you know, drain clog. Um, and in, in this, this design, it's so easy for our family to use this to replenish. Um, now, these are all pretty amazing things um, that really changed the business. In fact, in the past 18 months that we've been at Walmart, we have our stock prices doubled. We have the fastest growth we've ever had at Walmart, faster growth than Amazon. Um, but it's really just the beginning, and in many ways, I feel that there's so much more that we can do beyond just better shopping. So our design team created this web page design for Living Better, which is our design team. And this is what I want to talk about. I'm excited about all the stuff I showed you, but I'm more excited about where we're going next. Walmart's corporate vision is help people save money so they can make money. And the design team, we started to ask this question, how do you design for people living better? Walmart is the world's largest grocer. And when you look, particularly in the U.S., at the way that Americans eat, it's pretty horrible. We actually, Jamie Oliver gives this TED talk um, about food and about kids. And he's, you know, it was shocking to me to learn that the next generation of Americans will likely have a shorter lifespan than their parents, particularly because of poor food choices, obesity, genitive heart failure. These things are preventable through good nutrition. So the question for Walmart's design team is when we're the world's largest grocer, what is our role? in potentially helping households keep the same budget or maybe even save even more money, but still increase the, the nutritional quality of their food and having less processed food. These are fascinating questions that designers don't normally ask. Now let me give you one example of what we're starting to do. Um, we have a pizza night every quarter. We bring in 20 to 30 families that rely on walmart.com to shop. And they bring in their favorite magazine. And they sit down at a table and they create a collage answering the question, what does living better mean to you? They then walk us through their hopes and their dreams as a family. And they identify a part of their dreams that are broken. And then we say, well, let's use some magical thinking. What if anything is possible? Let's imagine that that could be awesome. And we bring in some improv coaches who, together with these families and us, we're kind of role-playing the future together. Our design team then takes all of these murals, these hopes and dreams of ordinary families that rely on Walmart, and start to think about, well, how can we change the way that we create tools and software to help these families live better? So here's just one example that we launched last week, which is, you know, it's kind of more on the fashion side, but I thought I'd show it to you because it's an it's a interesting step. One of the families we met with, the Rodriguez family, in their magazine that they brought in, they created this collage, and they said there's such a disconnect between the life that we want to live, and they were talking about like their home, a very simple home, and like, I see these magazine pictures, and it just feels like unattainable. Like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to create the kind of cozy, welcoming, stylish space that I want. So we actually ended up redesigning completely our home decor section of Walmart. And this is from People Magazine. They're like, wait, design double take. Walmart, is that you? <laughs> These rooms look awesome. <laughs> this is the same prices of Walmart products that we used to sell before. Now what we've done is we've actually put them together so that, there's an Amazon ad, which I just skipped over. Um, <laughs> and so what we started to do is actually in our website, created this whole new area about shopping by style. 
and actually showing how you can bring together different products that have a similar kind of design taste. Because a lot of our Walmart shoppers just they, they have a hard time doing that for themselves sometimes. So this this is launched last week. It's a very simple, humble step towards this idea of making ordinary people's hopes and dreams a little bit more accessible. Um, but even this, I'm not super excited about. I mean, this is great. It's a good step, but I think there's way more. And I wanted to share with you today, um, much like what Alan talked about, I think there's three, three things that all of us can work on to create solutions and designs to help society, to help people, to help any household or any worker that we're designing for help them live better. So I'm going to tell you at the front, it's these three things, being fearless, human-fueled, and being fast. I know human-fueled is a little awkward, but I wanted that, that third F. So if you guys have another suggestion for something that's talking about being focused on people. Um, and let's start with the first one, being fearless. And I'm going to ask you to be fearless right now. So what I want you to do is grab a piece of paper and something to draw with. Raise your hand if you don't have a piece of paper or something to draw with and we'll get you something. So what I want you to do is buddy up with some person right next to you. Give them a little fist bump. Just introduce yourself. Tell them your name. All right. Everybody's got somebody. Everyone should have a pair. And then raise your hand if you still need a paper or pen. Last one. Okay. Oh, we'll back here. Okay, everybody all set? Okay, so you now have a buddy. What I want you to do is in 60 seconds, in one minute, I want you to draw them. On your mark, get set, go. Way done. 30 seconds left. In the final 10 seconds, put your finishing touches on that masterpiece. Five, four, Three, two, one. Okay, awesome. Now share your drawing with the person who it's of. Okay, now hold these up for me. I'm going to take a panoramic photo. I want, to, I want to just capture this moment, which is so awesome. You guys ready? You have to stay nice and still. I'm going to start over here. Go across. These are beautiful. Excellent. And done. Okay, so what you guys have just done actually is a creativity experiment that was done by Bob McKim from Stanford University. This is Bob McKim on the left here. Now, Bob McKim did this activity with all kinds of folks, and every time he did this activity with adults, this is exactly what would happen. Lots and 
lots of saris. Even when I'm taking this panoramic photo, I was saying, like, I love this beautiful moment. And someone out here is like, yeah, sure. <laughs> These really suck, right? And even when I, like, walked through and I asked you guys to do this, I was just listening to some of the comments. And I think I heard someone saying, like, I apologize in advance. Like, I haven't even started drawing, but I know this is going to suck. And you guys are like creative, innovative professionals. And this is, every time you do this with adults, this is exactly what happens. Now, when Bob McKim did this activity with children, particularly elementary school kids before middle school and high school, there's a very different reaction. Any guesses about how kids react to this activity? Yeah, yeah, excited, awesome, they just do it. You know, kids actually are pretty amazing. They're not really excited about it, nor are they afraid of it. They just do it. And any of you guys who have kids or have worked with kids, what happens when you put out a sheet of paper and crayons? What do they do? They just draw. They just draw. And, any, you know, anyone who's a parent knows that kids just draw even if there isn't paper there, right? I mean, furniture, walls, you know. And Bob McKim did this activity to prove that human beings are innately creative, that we have an innate capability of making, of drawing, of expressing, and that somehow as we get into kind of the hormonal kind of strange years of middle school, when we start to like care about maybe the opposite sex or the same sex, and we, we start to fear the judgment of our peers. And then we start to have this reaction when we're asked to draw. And what Bob McKim said is that this is, this is the challenge in design and innovation, is developing creative confidence, is to regain confidence in that, in that ability. And there's actually a great book called Creative Confidence that was written by two of Bob McKim's mentees. Their names are the Kelly Brothers. They founded IDEO. And Bob McKim... His work, actually, with the, with the Kelly brothers and Tim Brown and IDEO, is where the D school started. So this kind of experiment and this thinking is the core of and the beginning point of designing for living better. You have to be fearless. And I think this is, ties really well with what we just heard Alan talk about, of questioning assumptions and going back to not just the safe, predictable things that we've done in the past. We have to have a mindset of just, of just creating and not worrying about the judgment of our peers. Okay, the second thing is about being human-fueled, and this is where the Play-Doh comes in. So if you already want to start getting a little bit of Play-Doh, um, this will be a good, good time to get started there. And raise your hand if you don't have Play-Doh, because we've got a couple extra jars. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so the second thing is about being human-fueled. And I have to say, to, to start here, we use the word user all the time in our profession, right? I probably heard it already six times today. And even the word UX, right? The U stands for user. And there's only two industries that use the term user that I'm aware of. One is software development, and the other one is the illicit drug industry. And it makes me feel that when we think about people, User is such a small, insignificant way to describe human beings. And I think the, what Alan talked about, this humility, puts us as designers into a place that recognize this. I don't care about you just when you're using my screen or using my software. I care about you and your goals. I care about you and your hopes and dreams. So actually, I propose that we banish the word user from our vocabulary. In fact, we changed our, our team's name from Walmart UX to Walmart Design because we want to have a different way of thinking about people. So let's talk about being human-fueled. I have to tell you about how I got into design. So my dad gave me this book when I was about 20 years old. This is a book called Information Architects by Richard Saul Orman. Anybody know Richard Saul Orman? Yeah, a couple of you guys. So Richard was a trained architect who got really excited about the challenge of designers taking massively complex data sets and making them clear. He also, by the way, started the TED conferences. So if you've any watched a TED video, that's what Richard started, the whole 
technology entertainment design. And in his book, Information Architects, he profiled the work of this guy, Clement Bach, who was an ex-Apple creative director, who started a design agency in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, embracing the complexity of massive information systems. So I ended up working for Clement at Studio, and he had this statement, which was the experience of the brand. And when Alan was talking about, we were at a stage where we had to invent new professions. They didn't exist. There wasn't training. We didn't have any tools. We actually took this title of experience designer. So when I first joined Clement Studio, I had this brand new business card. It was so proud of it. And like, Dan McCoskey, experience designer. I felt like a badass. I was like, I don't just design software. I design experiences. And then I was on this project for United Airlines where I met these really weird people called design researchers. Anybody here a design researcher? Any of you guys do design research? Yeah. So design researchers are interesting because they're like studying the people that we're designing for. And we did this method called paper prototyping, which I'd never seen before. Essentially, we had this blank browser screen where these researchers had some travelers kind of imagine what would be a personal, uh, personalized United.com homepage just for them. But I was kind of pissed off when I saw this. So I'm like, that's what I get paid $350 an hour to figure out. People don't know what they want. That's my job. This is the ego part, kind of beating out the humility part of my soul. And then in the next 18 months, the insights that came from that week of research ended up solving some of the most complicated interaction problems that we had faced. I kind of, the, the humility part started to come out. And I took out these crazy design researchers to lunch and I said, what do you guys do? Where does this come from? And they introduced me to the world of design research, and particularly Liz Sanders. Dr. Liz Sanders is my hero. She is the most, um, she's the most provocative and grounded thinker in design. And I read one of her pa uh, papers, which you can read at maketools.org, or maketools.com, I think is her site. And she said this, which I had just had these business cards made. <laughs> And I was like, what are you talking about? And I realized that this is how she defines experience. Experience is a personal, feel, a personal thing that I have. It's a moment in time at the nexus of our memories from the past, our dreams for the future, and that it is something that we can barely understand ourselves. Like, how many of you guys use Facebook? All the older people. Yeah. Everyone else is using Instagram and Snapchat probably. Okay, but Facebook has this feature where it's, it shows you like three years ago, this, this moment happened. I often have such a different perspective on my own moments that what Liz is saying is, we can't design your experiences. Your moments are your own, but you can design for experience. So that one small three-letter word, design for experience, really changed my perspective as a designer. And what Liz says is that there's only three ways to understand people. What they say, what they do, and what they make. What people say is 90% of traditional design research today. It's surveys, it's interviews, it's one-ones, focus groups, all of that. And over the last couple of decades, this whole field has been revolutionized with the idea of you can actually observe what people do. I've got three teenagers in my home, and I can tell you that what people say is often different from what they actually do. Um, so seeing actual behavior gives you all these rich insights. Now there's this other area of, of, of seeing humans, which is what people make. The reason why you have Play-Doh is because I want you guys to do a quick little activity that I hope you actually do with the people you design for to show you the kind of things that can come out by engaging people with their maker this is an example of what Liz and her team would do. This is actually a project for Microsoft. This is a game controller for home PC use. And Liz created this toolkit, this play kit, of little Velcro buttons and forms. And uh, like any good sociology or anthropology class, right, or uh, you know, work, you have a, a father and a son, who are the constituents here. They're in their native habitat, which is their home. And they are using this toolkit to kind of imagine ideal gaming experiences. 
and this, and when people are engaged in making new things happen. Now, I won't go deep into the academics here. You can read all about this at maketools.com, but essentially, you want to get to people's knowledge, which is deep, the latent or tacit knowledge. You know, the stuff that's on top, the explicit or observable knowledge, you can get through interviews and through observations about what people say and think. What we really want to get to, we want to get to that idea of a just, peaceful society. We want to think about what do people dream? What do they feel? What do they know? And if you want to get to that stuff, you have to do generative work. This is a generative session we're about to do. And so that's what I mean by human fuel. Don't just be human-centered. Don't use the word user. Think about people and their deeper hopes and dreams and have them participate with you. So when I was at Microsoft, we were designing this thing. Anyone know what this is? This is the original Microsoft service. Right before it got on like a, you know, a kind of a workout diet and became a small little tablet, it was a big-ass table. And our design team was trying to figure out how to create the interaction design. We had no idea what we were doing. There were no multi-touch interfaces at the time. So we brought people in, and we created this Make Toolkit. So this is a layer of acrylic. And the idea here is that we could create prototypes, but that people could just draw on the surface of the surface, and we could get this richness. So we were looking at a mapping scenario. And we had one participant who, and actually you can see, this is literally the prototype we made. These are fi literal file folders from Staples. We were at Microsoft. We were in the WIMP model, Windows Icons and Menus Pointer. Like this is, you know, this is the way that we were thinking about design. And when we, we actually tested out this mapping application, I remember there is this daughter, mother who came in on different sides of the table. And of course, they couldn't read, you know, only one person could read the text because it's a 360 UI. And they're kind of like, what does that say? And so the daughter just grabbed one of these file folders, started cutting it up with scissors. And I was like, I worked really hard on that last night to get this ready. Like, what are you doing? But they ended up creating this, which was this fan, which was brilliant. It allowed this thing to be switched around. It was 360. You could pull off one of these tabs. We ended up creating this whole interface based on this one user's, this one person's ability to kind of rethink things. This was my first introduction at this stuff. Let me show you more a recent one. So I used to work at Motorola. I, I led design research there for a while. And we created this thing. Anyone know what this is? This is the original Moto X. Did anyone own the Moto X? Yeah? Awesome. You have a Moto X? Oh my gosh. That's great. What do you love most about your phone? Yes. Yeah, you can personalize it. So you could actually turn, you know, you can use woods or different colors on the, on the actual physical hardware. Um, this is a phone that you got to design yourself. Um, now, what else? Did you ever talk to your phone randomly? Just on its own? You know. So one of the things, I, I should have coordinated this beforehand. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that came out with the Moto X was the ability to actually talk to your phone without pressing any buttons. So we're all familiar with this pattern now with Alexa and Siri and OK Google. The very first time that was created in kind of the modern era, era was with, the, with the, the X. And the way that it came out was my design research team went into people's homes with this co-creation toolkit. These were foam core boards wrapped in whiteboard material. So you can see here on the chair, lots of little squares of different sizes. And we had households across the country in their homes role play the five-year future. And so this is Jenny in San Francisco. She got home early every day from work. And she just liked to turn on the TV. And she liked the sound of just kind of something social happening before her boyfriend came home. And she said, you know, sometimes I like don't know what the remote is. It's like, I, I would love to come in. She actually had this dialogue with her TV. It's like, I want to come home. I want my TV to say, welcome home, Jenny. How was your day? <laughs> and, and it would say, do you want to turn on the news like you always do? She's like, yes. And, you know, this was long before we've seen that uh, actually happen. So when we showed this pattern, we saw this in households for different scenarios. Our engineering team said that they had this piece of silicon uh, called the X8 listening chip. It could actually do background processes from really low power. It could listen to a trigger word. 
And in our case, it was uh, OK Moto, or Hello Moto, right? You could kind of change it. And that was the, we developed something called touchless control, where you can say, OK Google, OK Moto, what time is it? Or what's going on? And what's so interesting about this is now this has become this really ubiquitous pattern, but we were able to see it much earlier because we involved people in that process. Now, we're going to do a quick making activity. So get out your Play-Doh or whatever it is called. Here, what is the name of this stuff? Yuva dough. Yuva dough. And while you open up your Yuva dough, does anyone know what Play-Doh was called before it was Play-Doh? It was, it was, actually. It was called Kutal. Kutal was a wall cleaner. Yeah, at the turn of the century when you would heat your home with coal, there'd be soot that would settle on your walls. You would need this putty to rub on your walls to clean off the soot. And, of course, Kutal wasn't really needed as we moved to gas and electric. And so the CEO of Kutal, they were about to go into bankruptcy. The week that they were supposed to file bankruptcy, they heard a story about a local school teacher who was taking Kutal, using it in her classrooms with food coloring drops and using it as modeling. So the CEO went and he saw this teacher and he said, that's what the purpose of Kutal is. And they launched Play-Doh. And for 50 years, it's been this really awesome symbol of creativity and play. Which is another good symbol of just see what people make with your products, with your services, their workarounds, their hacks, their things that they do that break what your intentions are, are often the best use of your time. Okay, so take your Kutal. What I want you to do for 60 seconds, again, it's a little bit harder to sculpt than draw. I want you to design, to create, to make a toothbrush from the future. You can do anything. Something that kind of deals with oral hygiene. 60 seconds, toothbrush from the future. Mark, set. Seconds left. Okay. Who wants to share their toothbrush for the future? Okay, so this is the sonic brush. So essentially it, it, it um, cleans your teeth immediately. All you have to do is pop it in your mouth. And, uh, <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. Be honest. How many of you actually bit into your Play-Doh? Anyone else? That's yeah, great. You know, this is interesting because why do we take a toothbrush, which is one planar surface, and then we do all this work to get it to four planar surfaces, right? Molding and 3D printing would allow us to create something that's custom molded to you. Why not just chew a couple of times? How many of you guys created some like round mouth guard like thing? Yeah, a lot of you guys. That just totally reshapes what a toothbrush should be. All right, who else had a toothbrush? Something similar to uh, the, the structure of your brush. So all that you need to do is plug it. It is as natural as how your jaw is built. And it takes care of the cleaning. It takes care of the cooling. It takes care of all the aroma that it can bring in. So it's a multi-purpose. That's great. The cooling is key. My mouth gets hot so much. I think that's great. Yeah, it's like, it's like a Roomba for your mouth. You just set it in there and it does its thing. That's great. All right, who else had another cool toothbrush for the future idea? Yeah. yeah, this acts like a massager also, so I can just keep it here and it will have that cooling motion. So uh, along with cleaning your teeth, you can keep it on your face and get it done. That's great. So it's multifunction. You get some massage and muscle relaxation as well. 
That's great. Right. Who else has something that's unique? the design for tomorrow's toothbrush, which is to say that you could use it completely, holistic tooth cleaning, or if at all there is something which is typical, particular, or you just want to enjoy like a human finger, you could still do that. So, right, you know, something which you could as well ponder while you are brushing and enjoying how your tooth are designed by God. That's awesome. Fantastic. All right, maybe just one or two more things. Yeah, what do you got? Tablets full of nanobots. That's fantastic. So, like, I love projects like this because it's like I have a toothbrush. Who needs a toothbrush, right? Just like, let me have something I can eat. Actually, if that was flavored well, I bet I can get my kids to brush their teeth. Just like, chew this gum, and nanobots are going to do the rest of the work, right? That's great. All right, one more. Yeah. Go ahead. That's great. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. It has backwards compatibility from the turn of the century. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Um, okay, so look, we didn't have time to do a control activity, but I guess the point of this is look at the kind of richness that comes just from without any briefing, just in 60 seconds using something like Play Doh, the kind of creativity that comes up. If I had asked a different team, to just write down their ideas and bullet points on a whiteboard or on a notepad, I think we would have kind of felt a very different quality. When we get into that mode of making, we get into a different zone of possibilities. So I want, please keep the Play-Doh and please use it on your next project. Now one quick example is IDEO actually was given the, this brief to create a toothbrush for children. And it was about 15 years ago. They were asked by Oral-B to create a toothbrush for kids. Now, they went out and they observed um, kids brushing their teeth. And this is kind of what they saw. What do you think their design researchers would have noticed from this picture? It's too long. It's a big adult toothbrush. Yeah, what else? Has anyone noticed the grip? Yeah, like when we adults brush our teeth, we have this really cool superpower where we use the pads and tips of our fingers because we have this thing called manual dexterity. And we're like ninjas with that toothbrush. I'm just going in every crevice. Kids don't have that superpower yet. They do what's called the fat fist. And when they brush their teeth, they're limited really basically to their elbow. And it's really hard for them to adjust. And so the IDEO research team noticed that. And they ended up creating the squish grip, which is the first ergonomically designed toothbrush handle for kids. And now every place where you buy toothbrushes, this is what you see, right? This innovation has kind of changed the industry. And I gave this talk at IDEO about how we can co-create and how we can get people involved. And there was a member of the original team from the Oral-B team. And I said, what do you think would have happened if you would have given kids Play-Doh? To not just observe how they brush. And they said, well, we would have seen, if I could borrow your toothbrush from the future, there's like... When kids would have done their toothbrushes and talked about it, and they would have set it down, you would have seen an ergonomically designed toothbrush handle. It's not that the kid would have said, I need an ergonomically designed toothbrush handle to make it easier to grip my architecture. Right, like, it's a latent need that would have come out in their creation. And not only would you have seen that, but you would have seen nanobots and Roombas, and you would have seen UFOs and candy and all these other cool ideas to spark your process. So that's the importance of making. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to share the last piece, which is about being fast. Having a sense of urgency is really important. And I think that this is compatible with slow thinking as well. I think you can, you know, move fast with purpose. And it's interesting, when I, I worked at Google for a couple of years, my boss was Dr. Rikin Dugan, who used to run DARPA. You guys know what, DARPA, know what DARPA is? DARPA is the U.S. military's advanced research projects agency. It's arguably the, one of the most innovative technical places on the planet. It's also kind of scary. I never wanted to piss off my boss because I knew there was a drone somewhere. She just take me out. But um, what's interesting about DARPA is they only hire leaders for 24 months and then they kick them out. No matter how good they are, no matter how good their projects are. And it forces them 
to be fast. It forces them to work backwards. It forces them to think about what do I want to create and then make those conditions real. And so she wrote this paper called The Special Forces Model of Innovation on Harvard Business Review. And I encourage you guys to look at it. This is a formula that you can apply to any team about how to, how to innovate. And she, it all starts with this question she gave a TED Talk about, which is, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Again, this kind of idea that is magical thinking. Like, what if everything, anything was possible? And the answer, my answer to that, to that question was, I want to make hardware more like software. We all have the ability to, to change any app anytime and have this kind of personal software capability in our hand. The hardware doesn't change. And so she said, okay, Dan, you've only got 24 months. What are you going to do to prove that that can work? So week number one, I ripped the back off a Motorola phone. I talked to some of my engineering friends. And they take this yo-yo board. This is basically an Arduino-compatible microcontroller and that allows all of the capabilities of the phone to be exposed outside. And then we said, okay, well, we have to create a development kit. Now, creating a software development kit is kind of easy. You can download it at 3 a.m. in your pajamas. A hardware development kit is a little bit harder because it's made out of atoms. So this is our hardware development kit. It is a Mercedes Sprinter van covered in 4,000 linear feet of Velcro. Because Velcro, let's face our, you know, it, it's awesome. Velcro is amazing. Um, and you can stick stuff to it and you can change it anytime. So it's a symbol of modular hardware. And then we had laser cutters and 3D printers, a couple hundred hackable phones, and then a team of makers to learn about how do people want to use this, this kit. And we drove uh, 14,002 miles across the country in, um, in doing every other day a hackathon for a couple of days, learning about what the next generation of engineers and designers want to make. So in day one, they would plaster this, this truck with their ideas about what they wanted to create. You can kind of see, like, it's everything from, like, a digital watch to a hover car to a TARDIS, right? Like, so various levels of, of functionality and feasibility. But we would say, choose one that you can build, prototype of, in a day. And at our very first one at Caltech, a team took a, uh, a work glove off of the truck, took some flex sensors and capacitive pads, and was able to translate American Sign Language into text messages so that people could communicate much more flexibly. And it wasn't perfect, it wasn't error correct, but it was working in a day. And we saw this time and time again. This is a portable eye diagnostics lab in the part of the world where you don't have access to a lot of highly skilled doctors. We saw these guys from MIT created this helmet that had an accelerometer in it because the biker um, on, a, on, a, on a dark night was riding home and actually stopped and uh, the bikes behind didn't see him. He got injured because the bikes ran into him. So if he were to slow down, he would have brake lights come on his, uh, his, his helmet. He also had this idea that if he turned his head, it would start blinking like he's trying to turn. But when he prototyped that, it was kind of like really hard. So they actually ended up creating this helmet, which raised about a million dollars on the Kickstarter campaign, to make this idea real with this new hardware development tool. And so we said if, if students in just a couple of days can do these awesome projects, the world needs a platform to do that in a new powerful way. So we launched Project Aura, which was Google's modular phone to allow anybody to contribute to your hardware. Now, it was just about a year ago that Google announced that they're shelving this project. And I wandered the streets of Palo Alto aimlessly for like two nights out of depression that this idea never made it to reality. But it was interesting because this whole idea actually did make it to reality. There was another team at Motorola that took our first prototypes, and they shipped a much more uh, simple version of this. So the Moto Z, the Moto Z2, these allow you to transform your phone into whatever you want it to do. Projector, camera, speaker. And actually, this is my main phone that I have right now. If you guys want to check it out, um, take a look. So sometimes this idea of moving fast, you're not going to get your goal. But there are very valuable things you can get into the world that get influenced by that thing. Okay, so that's it. I want to encourage all of you guys to, in your own space, think about those three elements. How can we be more fearless? How can we be human-fueled? How can we move really fast while thinking slow? And uh, create amazing things. Now, what I did, what I was told when I came here is bring a business card, and I'm all out. This is what my business card looks like. If I were to give it out to you, my title is Design Pirate, because I like to move fast in unconventional ways. But in the, in the interim, here's the ways that you can contact me. I would love to continue the dialogue. 
I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm going to be around throughout the day, and I would love to hear more. So thank you so much. It's so great to be back with you guys.